well, I think we should start now, it's 3 p.m., so thanks a lot for being here, appreciate. Um, my name is Victor Manuel Jaques Leal, um, and I'm going to tell you about something, uh, just trimmer and Syslink. We'll see what is all these things. And uh, thanks a lot for Colabora for doing this conference and for my employer, Igalia, who gave me the chance to work on this. Um, well, uh, the outline, what we're going to see, we're going to give an introduction of what is uh, Syslink. Uh, or the whole idea behind Syslink. Uh, what is the objective of this work? Uh, a more deep introduction of our idea of what Syslink what is. Um, we're going to talk about the hardware what we are using and how this is going to be adapted into GStreamer. The future, the, the foreseeable future, how it's going to evolve in time and the obvious references. So, well, we have to start uh, doing a certain bold um, sentence about that serial computing is dead, that serial computing is the, the one microprocessor working alone. And the parallel computing is uh, a revolution that started about 40 years ago, but now it's upon us. And we have to deal with that. And uh, so what is parallel computing? Uh, it's a why, it's why we have to work with parallel computing nowadays is uh, because we have the cheap performance warranty. What's the performance guarantee? That uh, we are accept certain level of, of, of uh, certain level of, of expectation. We're going to accomplish those, those expectations. And also, the, there is the promise that parallel computing will uh, lower our power consumption. Um, well, if we already accept that per the serial programming is difficult, the parallel computing is more, more difficult to work with. And we have to establish what, in w under which circumstances we want to deal with all the problems that parallel computing will impose. Uh, there are two uh, main uh, approaches to parallel computing. The, the, most, or the most common one is the symmetric multiprocessor. What's will be around for a long time ago. Uh, it's already in the kernel since I don't know when. And it's based on having identical processors, uh, single shared main memory, and we have only a single uh, instance of the operating system. Meanwhile, we have another approach to this, to the parallel computing, and it's the asymmetric multiprocessing. And in, in this approach, we can have different types of processors. We can have a normal CPU, general purpose uh, CPU, and have a DSP working on, um, have another type of, of general purpose working on them. And also, we might have different uh, memory areas for each processor, and also each processor can run its own instance of the operating system. or may run different types of operating systems. And this approach is what we're going to talk about in this, about Syslink. Uh, well, about, just another slide about the symmetric multiprocessing. It's the most common configuration, but it has also, uh, a lot of issues, like bandwidth issues. You have to share the whole pipeline on, on, to translate the information. Um, and also, the, the, the big failure or the big issue about its uh, architecture is that if one uh, CPU fails, the whole system go down, and that's not what we want in, a, in when we are expecting some guarantees of service. Um, and also, it's there is a paper saying that the cache currency, that is the way that CPUs ha maintain the same cache, uh, consumes uh, too much power. In, in the power is important for the better devices. And most of that application we're talking about, about here. Uh, and for the other side, in the symmetric multiprocessing, in the case of one kernel or one CPU goes down, crashes, the whole system maintains working uh, in general. Uh, but we have another problem here. We have to adapt our APAs in order to work with the different uh, CPUs or the other kernels working around. We have to offload 
specifically, or we have to say how to offload those information to the other CPUs. Also, this requires more hardware resource management. Instead, we have sharing resources. Where we have to control more uh, deeply, more be more sure how to control it, uh, particularly with the, with the memory. If one CPU is working in one memory area that is going to be shared by other CPU, we must lock their access. And also, it, uh, this, this architecture consumes more, more memory because each kernel of each CPU must have their own area for working. Um, this is one in, in, in the area of the asymmetric multiprocessing, one configuration is the one, and this is the most common one as far as I know. Uh, we have one master processor that is in control for all the I.O. and also all the, the user, uh, user interface. And also we have multiple remote processors. Those slave processors are so, but the main processor or the, the host processor as another devices on their dev uh, file system. And, and it's only one shared memory, main memory, but also each processor can register her own or private memory areas. And this configuration is what we want to talk about in this link. Well, the key, a key feature, like a key, uh, thing that we're going to need in a in um, asymmetric uh, multiprocessing is an IPC mechanism and interprocessors communication mechanisms in order to pass data or interchange uh, commands between among all the, the the processors. Here we have a graphic about how uh, one processor sent a message to another processor and go on, and we have. We need to have two, two or we have two kinds of IPC mechanisms in this. What is um, sharing memory uh, areas between processors for data interchange, buffers specifically, and also uh, passing messages between processors. We have to be able to send a message to another processor and in order to know that the other processor is, is can't process a certain buffer or can do any operation we want to from, from them. Um, nowadays, we have a lot of uh, socks in the market that are using that kind of multi-core technologies. This is just an example, one, one, just an example of them. Uh, so we're talking about something that we have right now, right here. So what is this link? Is the lastest? Well, it's, it's not the new one. It's not the current one, but it's the last this technology of, of asymmetric multiprocessing and interprocess communi uh, interprocessors communication developed by Texas Instruments. Um, so it provides mechanisms to control and communication between uh, host processor and remote processors. So what is the objective about this talk? Uh, I, will I will try to describe how to use this syslink in order to use those concepts and map those concepts into, into GStreamer. Why? Uh, one thing that I like is I think that maybe OpenMax is not the answer for all the, the questions and, re and we have to realize that we can, with using all the GStreamer, can go down and use the, the kernel APS directly. Also, well, we have the option to, to use OpenMax, and it's there, uh, but also we have to realize that we can go deeper and remove one layer that perhaps we can avoid. Uh, and also no extra libraries like sizzling users, paved leap memory, and other, other libraries that reduce it. We can slim down all, all, the, all the layers and access directly to the kernel and, and, and the devices. That was the objective I want to talk about. That made a little bit uh, controversial, but well, just an idea. Uh, another thing I want to say, this is a work in progress. It's not finished yet. I've been working for them from time to time. So that's just a, 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 to remind that. Uh, the Gitorius page for, for, for the, with, the, with the code is the first frame, and the second frame is the code for this talk. Well, um, in the history, has been a different implementation of uh, uh, asymmetric multiprocessing thing done by, by Texas Instrument. Uh, when in the times of OMAF2, we have 
uh, Texas Instruments only de delivered a, a reference implementation. Uh, they don't deliver a, a full package to work with. So in those days, Nokia developed its own, the, its own package. It is called DSP Gateway, which is full open source. And, and this is there, but it's only focused on OMAP2 uh, CPUs. Then for OMAP3, Texas System realized that they need to deliver to the customers a full implementation of uh, asymmetric multiprocessing and decided to develop this one and only supports their own DSP 664X. And it's already submitted to the kernel repositories, but I don't think it's going to reach the mainline kernel of Linux Torvalds, so it's remaining in the staggering, trying to get clean up and maybe we we'll never get that stage, but anyway, it's there. And, well, we have two, two, two parts of this. Uh, we have the, the kernel side, which, which is, we are assuming that, the, that the, the master CPU is running the Linux instance, and, is, and this kernel has all the DSP bridge uh, implementation who can communicate with another, with another CPUs. The, the, the other CPUs, uh, which are DSPs, um, they don't, they, they, their OS is a real-time OS, and it's totally close. And, and Texas Instruments provide all the tools to work to work with that. So, but anyway, it's not restricted to that. You can have other Linuxes running in those other CPUs. Actually, there's some effort to trying to port Linux to to that family of of these piece, and also GCC and L, LVM. So, well, uh, because of this, this P bridge has taken a long time to develop and struggled to, to reach the masses. Uh, the Da Vinci group developed another option that hit also the, the community, which is called the DSP link. And it's popularized because in Open Embedded is wide use it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an strip it down implementation of the DSP bridge, but it's not submitted to upstream. It will never get upstream. Uh, just if you grab the open embedded uh, distribution, you will get it in your kernel probably if you configure it, but it's just an extra patch that you need to to, to reach by yourself and, and put it. Uh, and finally, in for the OMA 4, uh, there is another alternative that is uh, Syslink. Uh, its orientation is to support many other CPUs. In this case, we are using the Cortex A and 9, which is the main CPU, and the other CPUs, which are Cortex M3 and, and also a, a DSP. Uh, right now, it's handled by downstream. Uh, in some cases, in order to use the Panda board, Texas Instrument associated with, with the Ubuntu, in order to, so Ubuntu can deliver to the community a kernel fully configured to, with, with Syslink. And that's way that, how it managed in order to gather community in that way. But the submitting those patches into, the, into upstream has taken a long time and a lot of cycles. And they are doing, and, and, the, and the full concept of GST Syslink has been changing and evolving during the kernel uh, development in, the, in upstream. And that's what we're going to be, RPMC, remote, mist, uh, remote proc, and it's target for OMAP 4 and OMAP 5. So what is the... What is the, the features that Syslinks provide? Well, uh, obviously it provides a, a me messaging mechanisms in order to, to pass uh, fixed size messages among the, the, the coprocessors. It also provides a dynamic memory management, so you can map uh, memory areas that are hosted in the different CPUs. So we can uh, access to that data or modify it if the other processors give us a chance. Oops. Uh, dynamic loading, so we can load another different uh, operating systems or programs into the other into the, into the slave processors. Power management, it's another stuff that is maybe not reached, um, maybe not there. In order to, we can turn off the other CPUs if we are not using them, so we can save power. 
Uh, another thing is the zero copy shared memory, so we can allocate one buffer and use it along all the pipeline, so we can avoid the zero copy. And another issue that they're willing to, to try is uh, to allocate memories in a 2D fashion, so we can do operations 2D operating more easily. And also call remote functions from other, in the other CPUs. This is more or less the architecture. The proc manager is, you have the host processor, which all does layers, and the slave processor, which all a less few la layers than the host because they don't have all the management that the host processor requires to do. Um, basically, the proc manager controls the others, the, the slave processors, the loaders loads the, the images of the, of the OS are going to be in the, in the slave processors. Uh, the message queue in order to, to pass messages between processors, the RSIM is the remote uh, color method, so I don't remember the name. Uh, the notify in order to, to notify messages, and well, that's another layers in there. So um, we have components here uh, that is going to be in the, uh, in the, in the general purpose on the master, in the master CPU, in the host CPU. And those, those components are going to be a list here. It will to be the, the, the multi-proc, so we can identify the different host CPUs that are on the board. Uh, another, opt another concept that is handled in Syslink is the shared region, so how is handled the different shared areas in the, in the, in the SOC. Also, we have a concept that is gate to in order to process memory areas from remote processors in order to avoid that another processor occupies that, that memory area. And the message queue that we saw before is how to send messages across different processors. The notify is a way to notify the user through, through interrupts that, that, we have, that, that, that you receive an, a message and you, you have to, to process that message. Uh, a heap that it's a way to, to manage the fixed size buffers. A heap mem is for manage variable size buffers within that shared memory that we described before. And well, this is the, a key com concept that is the remote command messaging. Uh, it's like, a, like, like an abstraction. Uh, and the top most abstraction is this called the RMC, RCM. Uh, and this is the the abstraction, we can see how we call messages or call remote functions like uh, RPC mechanism, which we send remote call function calls to the remote uh, or the slave processors and how it's handled. We have to, to this, the, the, the remote command messaging client uh, that matches the location and sending messages or receiving messaging to and from the, the, the remote processors. And the remote processors have the RNC server. Uh, which received the, 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 the messages sent by the RCM client and process that message and send back a message. So we have to ha keep in mind that the remote command message clients runs in the host CPU and the remote uh, command messaging run server runs in the slave or the remote uh, CPUs. So basically, I'm going to move this. Basically, uh, when we have an, uh, an application that is adapted to use remote procedure calls or, or which is links, and it calls our, uh, it uses the APA pr provided by the RCM client in order to, to, to call remote messages or remote functions that are going to be allocated in the slave processor. And that RCM client converts, it's just an adapter in order to convert into, into a message queue API calls. And the message queue APL calls uses the notify subsystem in order that the notify subsystem using an interruption, a CPU interruption, notifies the slave uh, uh, processor that have, have a message. So those messages passes in the, in the, in, at the same time. So the remote processor came aware that it had another message in, the, in his queue, process it, send it to the RCM server that's going to be, who's going to call the, the real processing uh, functions or algorithms that is hosted in the remote processor. And we have back all the, all the way. So, 
in this case, or in this work is based on the, on the Panda board, which is a OMA4 thing we have, as already said. The host processor is a Cortex-AM9 MP core, and it has, uh, for, for the slave processors, uh, two Cortex uh, ARM Cortex-M3, one DSP C64, and well, this is just another thing that it can be used as the, the 3D and 2D graphic accelerations, SGX. Well, there is a, th the, we're going to, to focus here in the, in the, in the Cortex-M3 processors. We're going to ignore for now the DSP because here is where all the batteries from, uh, for the coding of multimedia decoding is putting, is, is going in, in the Texas system in real from, for, for now. And this is how the both Cortex M3 processors are used. One is called the Sys M3, uh, just as the code name they use it, and it's used just only for notify driver. It was receive all the notifiers. Uh, and the other one is where the whole uh, multimedia decoding is going on, encoding or decoding. Uh, and then the whole system of the two Cortex M3 plus the the IVA HD subsystem and the IIS subsystem goes. The IVA HD is the, the which is done the there, there's some uh, hardware based algorithm that help us to decoding faster in 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 the hardware. And the I, ISS is all, is the same just for uh, in my images, like uh, grabbing pictures from the camera and all the stuff. So the app, app M3 is the is the remote uh, house or remote uh, processor that's going to do the, the decoding or encoding or whatever multimedia thing is required. So uh, on top of the of the RCM, which is the way to to send commands. And receive commands. Uh, we we need a, a way to to enclosure or to visualize or abstract all our um, multimedia codecs or algorithms. Uh, there are two two main uh, offers. This one, which is done by Rob Clark from ago, this is the distributed coding engine, uh, which is fully open source. You can grab the code and compile either the the current the the hot side and the slave side, and <clears throat> uh, it's just like it, the API resembles the old codec engine that is was developed for the DSP link that you remember was some the previous things of, of the of the of this history of the asymmetric multiprocessing, uh, and this one is synchronous is. Which is mean that you send a buffer and you sit and wait for the for the output buffer, so the, pro, the already processed buffer. The other option that is delivered by Texas Instrument in commercial way is the open the distributed open commands, the, the OMX, and it's the same. Just is has more power. There is totally is fully asynchronous. It's closed and it's and his API and its API is fully coupled or tightly coupled with the OpenMax EL API. So when you are using the OpenMax EL API from Texas System and you are using distributed OpenMax in the in, in on top of the RCM. Uh, sorry for that. Well, you review whole the whole thing. <laughs> So uh, on top of that, uh, there's another element that, you, uh, that we must take care of when we are doing the, the, the call directed to the kernel. Uh, that is the DMM tiller or tiller, which is a, way, which is a mechanism, it's a, hard, it's a piece of hardware that TI provides in order to, to, to control memory areas in a 2D fashion. So we can, that, that tiller uh, allow us to allocate freeing and mapping to to the memory areas that which can hold in containers. And with those 2D blocks or memory areas, we can do rotating and mirroring more easily with zero uh, 
almost zero uh, computing cost. But the, the thing is that uh, mechanism is going to be replaced by, by, a, by a driver for the, for the GM, uh, GEM from the DRE infrastructure, the direct rendering infrastructure, because while well, they had some discussion in the kernel that this was just another way to do what the DRI was doing, so they're going to replace this APA for the kernel APA into the, the, the gym as a gym driver. Well, oh, again, we're almost in the end. Well, so we have all that just at, at the end when we are coding, it's just, they are just a bunch of EO controls and juggling with memory areas in order to say this area is going to be in, in, the, in the slave processor and that memory area is going to be in, the, in, the, in our primary area and that's Muppet buffers are going to handle us. At the end, it's just your controls and juggling with memory, uh, with other, sp other spaces in the code, at the end of the code. And how we can map all that, the, the problem is how we can, that, the, and it's part of the job or the work that I haven't done yet. Uh, gonna see, uh, but that's how, how we match all that information, all that uh, elements in the kernel into the GStreamer realm. And that's another issue that we face when you are using the Tyler, is that we are using 2D buffers, and we need to use the, the we need, those buffers have roast, right? There's just a space in the, in the, in the buffer where the, as Beam say in, the, the, in his presentations, where the, the codex or the, the, the algorithms can scratch there in order to facilitate the, the operations. So, how we handle this uh, row stride in the in this streamer? Uh, Rob Clark uh, developed this just a stride transform, imposing the X row Y U V strided uh, caps or media media type, uh, but it's not it's not going to be adopted and there's still discussion in in this streamer. Dot 11, if it's going to be used with just the meta under the buffers. And this is an open problem, as far as I know. Uh, the other problem that I don't know how to manage is how to use the, this buffer pool of, of the, that is offered by Duty Tyler, by the, by the Tyler. And there is a scratch of an idea about using a buffer pool, but it's only using the 1D because Tyler can also malloc alloc allocate buffers when 1D. But that 1D can do the rotating and the mirroring stuff, but anyways, there. So there is a uh, an idea about how, how to handle that for 1D, for how, but the, the problem is how to handle with 2D, and if the think uh, I'm thinking about using the just the buffer pool, I don't know. Um, that's an open question because I haven't reached that point of doing the, the exact g streamer elements for that. Um, and also another problem is that the synchronous, which is a synchronous output buffers. With DSC, there's no problem because it syncs, so just using the, 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 the chain method, just send a buffer and uh, wait, sit there waiting for the, for the output buffer. But in the distributed open max, it's a sync, it's how to handle. The idea is using the gstpad task and waiting for a for a queue message in another thread, something like that, like this, like is implemented in this P bridge, in just this P, sorry. And well, the future. The future is uh, that this RP message is going to change. It's going to uh, substitute the the message queue thing, uh, which is a virtual based messaging bus. And it's developed by Ohad Benan. He's going to be at the ELC giving a talk about this specifically. And also the remote queue, because it's a, it's a way to, to, to control the, the remote processors. One thing that they are doing that I think is great is that uh, the, the blobs or the images that is going to be uploaded into the remote processors now is going to be handled as a firmware loading, as you were as the, as, as the firmware that 
this loaded into the wireless cards and all that stuff, so we can ignore now from the user space that, that, that issue that is loading the firmware. And uh, also, they are hiding all the juggling of the memory space address, and at the end, what is D DOMX or lib uh, DCE is going to be another kernel driver. So all the complexity of juggling with or, or managing the, the address space is going to be put it in the kernel and move it out, move it out from the from the user space. I don't know if that's the correct way to go and push more uh, effort in the kernel, but that's the way they are doing because another thing is that you can trust in the developers that are doing the, the right thing, uh, playing around with the with the uh, virtual memory areas and and, and so. Uh, so well, the conclusion is well, we can live, we can go deeper and and work more nearer to the to the kernel and to the these uh, abstractions. Uh, and well, the open question is how to deal with strides for with for pools with asynchronous output buffers and match credits. And thanks a lot for for being here and listening. Any questions or stuff like that? Okay, I have half an hour for, for enjoying the other talk. <laughs> Thanks.